Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Moosey Dreyer and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Moosey Dreyer. And today, we are thrilled to welcome someone who has been a writer, producer, director, including the recently released The Keepers of the Five Kingdoms, available now on multiple streaming platforms. He's also an actor who you'll no doubt recognize from his well over 100 credits, including having been in one of the most beloved holiday films of all time, A Christmas Story. Please help me welcome Zach Ward. Zach, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Happy to be here. Well, you've been involved in so many different things over the course of your career, and we, we have a lot to cover. But to start with, we normally ask people if they come from a, a background or family that was involved in the arts. You did. Your your mom, Pam Hyatt, is an actress. Was that something that she kind of pushed on to you? Or do you remember seeing her do it or wanting to do the same thing? Uh, no, my mom didn't push it on me. I grew up around it. Uh, my mom, Pamela Hyatt, she's 88 years old now and still uh, going strong and, right. and doing her one-woman shows. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up on sets from the age of five, whether they were uh, TV shows, commercials, movies, or backstage at plays. Um, I started falling in love with it around the age of eight uh, at the Stratford Festival Theater out in Stratford, Ontario, and being backstage wow. with the swords and uh, the armor of the Shakespearean plays. <laughs> and then I asked my mom if I could do it, and she said, no, I want you to grow up and have a normal job. <laughs> uh, it was because my older brother said, uh, "What is the definition of an old, uh, of a real of a normal job?" And she did not have, she could not qualify that. Then um, it was my older brother who really helped me push for the opportunity. And then when I was ten years old, I started auditioning for commercials, and I spent about a year auditioning for commercials before I got my first job uh, doing a commercial. I believe it was Dolly Madison ice cream. Uh, back then, I was still, I had a little nose and big eyes, and I was adorable. And then I grew up and got a big nose and slanty eyes, and so it went all crazy. Um, and then my first feature film was A Christmas Story at 13. Well, and- I want to go back to the commercials for a second, because you, 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 the first thing we, you mentioned to me when we first corresponded is that you you did something with Dave Thomas when you were a kid. Yeah, yeah. And, um, right, Dave so- Thomas, I did a, a Bell Canada commercial, which was our uh, Bell Canada as the telephone system in Canada back then. And um, yeah, I got to do a commercial with Dave Thomas and especially growing up in Canada back then when SCTV was the best thing right. ever. Uh, so to work with him was like, yeah, big bragging rights, buddy. That was that was <laughs> the high point. He was did you, awesome. Did, did you get to be with any other people that you loved as a kid? Like, you know- Oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, I'm in a, I did an, a, <laughs> SCTV was big in Canada, and there was, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there was one episode where the lead characters are, uh, they have a sketch where they're they're running for the mayor of Mellonville, and it's John Candy and Eugene Levy and Joe Flaherty Mm -hmm. and Martin Short, and uh, they're holding their uh, mayoral debates in a high school gymnasium, and the only audience in attendance is a group of Boy Scouts. And I was one of those Boy Scouts, so you got to see the back of my head. I was on cloud nine, buddy. It was the best. It was so good. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And you yeah. know Zach, Damn it, you're still adorable. I, I don't, you know, I, I know you don't want to, come on. Thanks, mom. <laughs> hey, um, and I'm sure we're gonna get into Christmas Story and all, and all the other uh, kinds of things, but um, so, well, what was it? So when you started when you were 10, was there a moment as a child actor? Cause you know, I was myself and many people around us, I'm sure, you know, also um, were child actors. I feel like there's like a moment where you you realize, Oh, I'm not just running in and saying, taking a bite of something, whether it's commercial or not or whatever. <laughs> it's like acting like, like, did, have you, did you like see a grown up actor or something and think that they were actually talking real as them and you realize oh wait no they're doing their dialogue oh sh- 
crap, that's natural and that's acting. Like when you were a kid, when did you like grasp? Maybe because your mom was an actor. So I, I don't know. I get your question. Um, again, uh, so my older brother's eight years older than I am. Mm -hmm. And when he moved out of the house, uh, and I think like 18, uh, he had like a, he had like a shitty room somewhere. Oh, sorry. I don't mean to swear. He had a crappy <laughs> room somewhere. Um, but we, he did this thing. It was really cool. Uh, he would do these things out over weekends where I'd come over and I'd hang out with him and we'd have a pizza party and watch movies on Laserdisc. And we discussed them. So, you know, I'm watching uh, The Deer Hunter and Easy Rider and Excalibur and Great. Um, uh, Phantom, of the, uh, Phantom of the Paradise. And but it's not just watching the movie, it's sitting there and then talking about the film. Like that was the joy of it. Um, so you're analyzing it. And then um, you're you're hundred percent right, dude. Moosey, that's a really interesting question. No one's ever asked me because you're right. In the beginning, you're like, I'm cute. Look at me, yeah, right. I eat the ice cream, I eat the jello, I blah, blah, blah. I got a balloon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's very thin and two dimensional. And there was um, there was a TV show that I auditioned for. I remember this. It was a Canadian TV show. Uh, I can't remember the freaking name of it, but it was very successful. Won a lot of our Emmys, whatever the hell they're called. Mm -hmm. um, and the role was a boy who was who was uh, charged with killing. He was a teenage boy who was charged with killing um, this other boy. And he's talking to his lawyer. So the, the, the show is about lawyers. And the, the lawyers are saying, did you kill him? And the, the boy says, uh, my character says no, and reveals that he was in fact his boyfriend, so that he's gay. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, you have to say this. And he won't because he doesn't want his father not to love him. I'd never done anything like that. So in the beginning, I remember the process was one of memorizing the lines and getting them down and blah, 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 and getting it wrote mm. and done out, blah, blah, blah. But then something happened in the room during the audition that had never happened to me before, which was that I started connecting to the emotional feelings of neglect of missing my own father. I didn't grow up with a dad. My dad was a draft dodger and went back to the uh, United States mm -hmm. after Carter granted amnesty. And, and th that sense of loss and that sense of desire mm -hmm. for being approved of. And I started breaking down, dude. I'd never cried in an audition. Um, oh, wow. And even if I had had to, it was more like, ha -boo. it was yeah. that kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. crappy cry where you're like, yeah. Shut up. and so I, uh, I did that audition and the room broke like the i had casting director director producer there and they were weeping and i i get, we're done and i they're like are you okay i'm like uh like it was weird man yeah and then and then and then, <laughs> and then i get a call back for this thing and i go in and this time i'm i'm kind of looking for that emotion i still don't really have the skill set you know and um, I get there, but it doesn't take me over. I can cut mm -hmm. it down at a certain point. I can stop it. But again, everybody in the room, tears in their eyes. So, it, so here's the great part. It was a two-part education. One, it was a, that was the moment that really told me, taught me something different about how to connect with the story on the emotional level where Yes, it's words on the page from somebody else. Yes, I'm pretending, and it's all a lie. But no, it's actually true. These are real emotions. This is where the empathy yeah. comes from. So, and then that was an incredible experience. Obviously, I'm th talking about it a million years later. But then the next part of it was even better education. They're like, you didn't get the role because you oh, have wow. red hair. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's why wow. you can't. You can't. You what? could do. You did everything you could, right? You did and then they just wow. go like. And by the way, we got some of these for you. And you're like, yeah. okay. 
So what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a, you were yeah, two times are, better than the last yeah. guy. <laughs> you're fantastic. By the way, there's no Santa Claus, no God. You're all going to die. Bye. You're like, Bye-bye <laughs> now. Hey, I'm sorry we don't validate. Um, uh, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. And, you know, I, I know what you're talking about, how, like, uh, so your first call, you, you, you were bawling. You were tapping into the emotion. But, like, that's the next trick is how do I take that, put it in a bottle, and pull it out the next time for your callback or for when you're rolling, you know? So, that's so that, the hard part. It is, but that, that, that answers your question. That was the first time I really fell in love with that part of the process. Yeah. And then that, that changed my relationship with acting for the rest of my life. Right. Oh, well, wow. you know, your career makes sense to me because, you know, you're a director, you're a successful director, and you've done so much acting. Um, but you were when you were talking about your your lineup or when you used to watch uh, films when you were younger. So I did to me, I, mine was Taxi Driver, and I was a little kid. Yeah, yeah my, and, my brother did that with me too. Yeah, and Phantom. We had Paul Williams on this podcast, by the way. Oh no, kidding! But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I say we. I just took over for a much better co-host. Uh, That's not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah no, but I can I, tell. I can recent, tell. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, but recently on the, you're not as Any, cute as, as you anymore. were anymore. No. Um, <laughs> we all, we actually also did a forgotten films on Phantom of the Paradise. We did a special de dedicated just to that movie. Oh no, kidding. Yes. <laughs> so let's get into Keeper of the Five Kingdoms. This is a movie that okay. we wrote, produced, directed, edited, and put out in the world. It is a. It's like the Goonies means big trouble in Little China. Movie. I was there at the premiere. Were you? Yep, I was there. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, uh, James Hong's birthday that night. Yes, sir. Everyone went out to the federal afterwards. Is yeah. Uh, I mean, let's get into this movie. But like that night, like were you just floating? You just if this is your baby. I mean, you edited, wrote, directed. There are effects. It's an intimidating film to to take on, I imagine, because it, it was it was a lot going on. I mean, the process. Yeah. And and go ahead, go. go. Uh, did you get to see, see the film, Jonathan? I have not yet. I have not yet. I want to see it there. Yeah. Well, for four ninety nine, you can see it. Uh, you can buy okay. it for for uh, ten dollars more than that. Play uh, Vimeo, Vudu, and your yes. local ca uh, cable subscriber right now. Yes, <laughs> we were, we were going to cover all that. We've been asking where it is, and we had a lot of questions about that movie as well. So, yeah, uh, man. Yeah, so, it's a, it's a it's a difficult film. There's uh, close to 600 visual effects in it. Wow, uh, which is like way more than the original Star Wars. The practical effects in it, as you're aware, there's full on Yoda style puppets. There's animatronic headgear. There's prosthetics. There's uh, miniature donkeys. I mean, there is a ton of stuff that is uh, difficult and dangerous for a production to do, especially at an indie budget level. So it was a real big bite at the Apple. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, it is an indie film. And I, I think, you know, when someone's like, well, it's not, it's not Dune. I'm like, you're, you're right. You are 100% right. It is not Dune. Um, but when it comes to being a family film in the vein of the Goonies or Never Ending Story or Labyrinth or Dark Crystal, uh, I would proudly show it to any of those filmmakers and, though, and that crew. Yeah. And, well, and, but, and not, com not comparing it to, but the quality of what we were able to create on the budget that we have, and that's not an excuse, that's a reality. Um, I'm really proud of it, and I'm 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 excited for people because they, you know, that night, to answer your question, hmm. I was floating, but I find it obstreperous, I find it obnoxious when you go to see somebody's film and they come up and go, so what did you think? What did you think? What, 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 did, what, did, what did you think? <laughs> I don't like that. I think that's vulgar and I understand why they do it. It's insecurity, mm -hmm. but the reality with the film or any piece of art or something you make is once you're done, <laughs> it's not yours anymore. It goes out to the world and someone's going to say it's the greatest. And someone else is going to say, I hate it. It's a piece of garbage. And they're both right for them. Um, so I didn't want to be that person. So I stepped away. I stepped back. And if someone wanted to come up to me, they could, but I did not want, to push myself upon anybody. And the best experience I had was 
people who came up to me who I didn't know, who were like, oh, are you the director? You're the director, right? You were talking. I was like, yep. I'm like, oh, we saw the movie. I said, thank you so much for coming out. And they're like, oh my goodness. It was so funny. Oh yeah, and this part was funny and that part was funny. It was like, oh yeah, but it was sad. I mean, I cried. Me, I, me too, I cried at that part. And then I laughed again. Yeah, it was funny, but it was sad, but then it was funny. Oh, I had such a great time. And that arc in there, yeah. something cannot be sad if you don't care. Of course. So if I got a chance to help you care about these people you don't know in that period of time with all that stuff going on, that's awesome. That was Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. Well, something, I, yeah. So so something, I, I want to ask something. You, you, you collaborated on that, like you mentioned, with James Hong. And uh, so how did that pull come about? You know, we were a big fan of his too. How did that come about to uh, get him involved with this? Uh, James Hong actually called us. Our studio is Brilliant Screen Studios. My producing and business partner is Ace Underhill. He started uh, Brilliant Screen Studios roughly about 12 years ago. Uh, no, more like 15. And it was originally a rental facility um for for different productions and then in 20 uh 2019 uh we took over um built out our own stages and warehouses mm -hmm. and created a back lot um james hong contacted us looking to do rentals for a project that he wanted to do a test on and then uh, we learned that he i mean he's a very talented actor wonderful human being producing and getting everything put together is a difficult process and arduous if you don't know what you're doing let alone if you're late 80s so at that point we wanted to help him out and uh we talked to him about his story uh that he had and then we agreed to come on board as producers directors and writers so he originally came to us for one reason and then it became a <laughs> synergistic function when you're directing James Hong and George Takei, do you feel like any sense of pressure or intimidation in there? With George, I mean, for, with James, getting to know him in the beginning was a tad intimidating because he was one of my heroes from all the films as mm -hmm. a kid. Uh, and then, you know, there was a lengthy amount of time before we actually shot. So I had built a relationship with him um, before we were ever filming. With George Takei, uh it was a much tighter relationship time period. So there was still, I was still fanboying by the time <laughs> I was directing him. And then he did, uh, it was really cool. He did the voiceover for the uh, this tortoise character and he did it, he was in New York City. So uh, we had him picked up in a, in a limousine, driven to the a sound studio and at the sound studio was waiting a lovely basket. And then you'd go into the ADR booth and then there was a camera so we could be at the studio in Los Angeles looking at oh. the, uh, the monitor and listening to him and I could direct from there. And at one point he does a, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a, he, he does a, he does a pass on a, a line reading. And I said, um, uh, George, the, remember in this certain line is, let me just give you a, a reference material. It's like, oh yes. <laughs> like okay so um uh, i said remember in star wars how when luke skywalker is uh running on uh, is trying to shoot on the death star and to to get the the photon for the torpedoes or whatever it's called down the tube right and and uh you have obi-wan kenobi comes over and goes use the force luke right he goes oh yes wonderful scene yes i was like well that's kind of what this moment is like. He goes, oh, yes, fantastic. So he does it and he kills it. And then I realized, I said, you know what's funny, George? He goes, mm, what's that? You go, um, because there's such a battle between the Trekkies and the Star Wars <laughs> sure, nerds sure. that if the Trekkies found out that I gave you a directorial note based on Star Wars. I was thinking the same thing. They, they would kill me. He goes, oh, my, yes. You'd be good at it. Right. And I was like, this is fantastic. This is a great moment in my life. Um, I mean, George Takei, huge working with uh, Getty Watanabe, uh -huh. wonderful human being. John Bailey as the voice of the Woo Witch, 
Um, you got uh, Dante Basco and Dave Sheridan as Hank and Frank. Really funny, classic comedy style. Very Laurel and Hardy, and they really bring a flair to it. The kids were great. Bai Ling was amazing. I mean, Moosey, you see Bai Ling, and without giving anything away, her art, her level of batshit crazy, to me, was very similar to Lo Pan in Big Trouble in Little China. And when she goes emotionally later, she killed, dude. She well, but yeah, I agree with you on that, man. And what, like, you're directing these like a legend. You got you have some legends, but also you're directing some kids. Now I, I ask you, um, because it was my experience when I first got into to the DGA, it was a children's show, and I was an adult, of course, at that time, and I was directing children. And now I was a child actor myself. This is similar to your situation. Did you find that very um beneficial to you to like to talk to them? Cause you know where what you know what they're going through right now. Yes. Uh, so they're different experiences. So if you look at the poster behind Jonathan's head, there's, um, there's the boy is, uh, yeah, the boy there is Matt Sato. Yeah. Matt Sato plays Hopper. And then the young lady, Michelle Mao plays, uh, Patsy. And then there's another girl, uh, Anna Har, who plays Squirrel. Um, Matt Sato had really not done much in the way of acting before, but he was very, comfortable i you know he was such a awkward boy he just came off like a big lanky boy and mm -hmm. he was 17 right it was great he was 17 but what's the thing where you can work as an 18 year old and yeah, his dad emancipated. was there yeah emancipated mm -hmm. um his dad was there uh he's uh matt is from hawaii um his father is japanese or hawaiian i believe and his mom's white and they're a lovely family and, you know, Matt is a very handsome young man. He looks like a, a half Hawaiian version of Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> and Kim, I was able to kind of galvanize with the boy thing uh, because he'd be messing with his hair because he's pretty. And I come up to him and be like, hey, princess, you touch your hair again. I'm going to shave it, glue it to your ass and make you walk in your hands. You got it? All right. <laughs> That's directing. And he, would, and he would be like, okay, all right. And he'd laugh. And his dad was like, good. Now, with Michelle, that's not the right tactic. Uh, Michelle, you know, I talked to her about her previous moment, what she was going into and trying and leveling up. Because, you know, she's carrying a lot of weight on her back. Uh, Michelle, originally the film's called Patsy Lee and the Keepers of the Five Kingdoms. Mm -hmm. The titular character. And she is the lead of the film. So she's carrying, she's in every freaking scene, man, pretty much. And so there was like, I, she was a pleasure to work with because I could sit with her and I could talk to her about what the prior scene was and she wouldn't have any garbage in her head. She would listen and we could get to a point of an emotional readiness. Um, there's a scene in there where she was crying and she did it beautifully. And all it yeah. was was you know you got the whole crew ready to go you're jamming you're getting and things going all right it's so busy stop with the busy come in get quiet talk to her about what she's just lost why she's let her family down how hard this is how it's breaking her heart that, that's fantastic take that moment mm -hmm. let her sink into that the tears build up naturally in action and then you go and and that she the fact that she trusted me like that that quickly I'm incredibly grateful for and I, my goal was to earn that trust I believe that that is a sacred thing between a director and the cast that I don't care who they are it, like your goal is to protect them from everything even mm -hmm. themselves right uh, on. <laughs> Anna Har I worked with in the past she's my little ringer uh, I know that she can go do anything at any time. So I knew by putting Anna in there, I always wanted Anna to be squirrel. She was always my go-to. There was never another a second of doubt. It was written for her, knowing that she could do the comedy, the drama, the sympathy, the character arc, the action, everything. And I could be like, Anna, good. Uh, you're giving me a four. Uh, I need a six. Or you're at an eight. 
throw it away. Give me a five. I want, and then give me a button on the end of it. So I got something to cut to and then give her a moment. And she's in like, she's that person that made it really easy. The one thing I had to be cautious about is sometimes I got a bit of a potty mouth. You might've noticed. Um, and working with kids, you know, you got to just try and find a way to walk the line and not be disrespectful <laughs> and not be in a, like that type of inappropriate because people can be a mm. little bit more sensitive nowadays, but that's okay. I mean, right. well, you know, you're really not going to, you're not going to offend the kids with the potty mouth. You offend you know, the and parents and the maybe, welfare of the teacher. Yeah. Maybe you are. Maybe yeah. you are. And then, and maybe. then it's fair enough like that you have to put your own stuff in check because I think that's, and you know, this, you know, this Moosey as a director, as a child actor, there are a lot of directors, but when we were kids who would yell and scream and curse at kids and just go off because that was allowed back in the day, just yeah. being a freaking monster on set was part of the persona yeah. of being a director. And, and, but I got to work with Bob Clark, Bob Clark yeah. from the Christmas yes. story was the sweetest, kindest man and a leader and he was strong and you could trust him. And I wanted to be that guy yeah. for the team. Well, yeah. we're, we're going to get onto the Christmas story, of course, because you can't, you can't escape it, but <laughs> let me, let me, just, let me, let me just tell you real quick how your answer landed on me. And it's all subjective, but to me, it was what I wanted to hear and is right, which is, so you, you treated, uh, act, uh, directing, uh, minors, um, individually you read the the person you read the human and you directed this well this now she needs to be approached this way he you did it no differently than you would an adult and that's what I, that's what i love you know, and yeah, you just spoke to them like you know one i want that that's why they trusted you you, you like, weren't you bullshitting know. them so they're they're going to be there for you that's yeah it was, it was a great experience it was a great experience and let's be honest there was also days that sucked because there yeah. was not enough time people were tired I mean, yeah. We did some brutal stuff on that film. We I were bet. Staying, we, we were staying at Mount Whitney. <laughs> we literally were up on Mount Whitney staying in like tiny little vans and RVs, like tiny type of like, I mean, trailer trash RVs up there on the top of a mountain getting up at four o'clock in the morning because there's no daylight. Like you yep. got six hours of daylight and you can't run generators because of forest fires holy crap okay. and you sucks. signed up for that you know Adventure. filmmaking man <laughs> filmmaking well more power to you congratulations you know i just Everybody. to get a, mm -hmm. a, a you know film made but what an ambitious one too because you know you've got like you know puppetry <laughs> and like you said and maybe green screen or whatever you work and you've got like people having to find their eye lines for something they're given dialogue to something that may not even be there you know it's not even like a, it's a, a creature yeah, or well, that's a that's the other thing that's different you know it's like on this film we did green screen we did uh led wall we did unreal mm -hmm. engine set extension um we did not do miniatures on this one um we did some forced perspective stuff you know there were a lot of tricks there were a lot of tricks so you're not just filming what's in front of you you're filming for what you haven't built yet yeah you have to decide, I'm saying. like what the hell dude <laughs> like what can go wrong oh everything went wrong everything went wrong yeah well good yeah. good that's it's supposed to <laughs> so christmas story you said was your first film right so how'd that come about how, how did that come into your life it was basically an audition. I'm in Toronto, Canada. I'm 12 or 13, yeah, 13 years old, something like that. And I'm, uh, I get an audition for the role of Scott Farkas, and he is the sidekick, not the bully. So my audition is on a VHS tape. Uh, it's a cattle call, 300 other, 500 other kids. I walk in and go, nah, you're Aunt Tilly. Get over here. Man, <laughs> thank you. Next. And then I got callbacks and it goes, you know, 500, 300, 200, 100, 50, wow. and, and I get the job. And then um, I've never met the director. It was all on VHS Ted. And then I show up, I get into wardrobe. I meet guy, the guy who plays Grover Dill. He's a foot shorter than me. We walk out on set. Uh, we're introduced to the director. He looks at us, sees us, the height comparison. And he's like, oh. Oh, you get his <laughs> line, you get yours. Uh, and then I became a legend. 
And now I have action <laughs> figures, you know what I mean? So, <clears throat> Were you familiar with the Gene Shepard stories at all or no? No, I was no, nothing. What? <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned Bob Clark. <laughs> just... Comic books, bro. <laughs> well, same here. But you mentioned Bob Clark. So you 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 said you loved him as a director. It's always so we, like weird to me that the guy that did Porky's did this right after. Yeah, actually, uh, and Porky's too would not happen unless the studio let him do a Christmas story. That was his negotiation, and wow. he actually lost money on a Christmas to get it finished. Ah. Ah, the more you well, never really financially um, benefited from a Christmas story, even though it's a massive financial success. <laughs> that's that's crazy. That's good. It's uh, life, man. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, let me just tell you. Um, so I I have a I have a son. I have one child, one son, and I bought him the DVD, the special edition Christmas story, because I wanted that to be part of like the holiday rotation for him you know and it turns out that that, that i didn't need to do that it's on all day all long day, you know, <laughs> during the right we love the film i was a grown-up when it came out and you as the bully still scared the crap out of me by the way um <laughs> you were so good man you were just so good and so what is that like you're in a movie like it or not for the rest of your life it's like it's it's a seasonal thing where they're going to be, there's a marathon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an honor personally. I think it's amazing. You know, there's going to be a marathon of a film that you're always going to be a part of once a year, every year. Is that cool? Or is that like, Oh God, here it comes again. Cause I know you, you, you're, you're asked the same questions all the time, but go ahead. Go ahead. So let me address that. Um, it, you know, it goes on a, uh, on a, on a scale, the way you have the experience, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't start off all at once. It started off like when the movie came out, nobody cared. Right. Um, there was no following. It didn't do anything in the box office. No one mm -hmm. gave a crap. And I remember being 17 years old, working in a deli and uh, as a waiter and a family was like, hey, weren't you that guy on a Christmas story? And I was like, <laughs> I do other things too, you know. Meanwhile, yeah. I'm delivering jam and a bagel with cream cheese. Right. Um, so there's a level where it didn't do anything. Then people associate you with the failed product and you want to be more than that. And then it continues. And it was around the 20th anniversary where the country basically went, this is a classic. And yeah. then at a certain point, it was registered. It's uh, in the Library of Congress <laughs> and considered one of the top 100 uh, pieces of American cinema of the last nice. century. And then it's in the Smithsonian. So technically I'm a national treasure <laughs> and it is as you grow older and you, you realize like when you're younger, you're like, I'm going to do great. And this is what's going to happen in my life. And these things are always going to work out for me. And then you grow up and 90% of everything doesn't work out. And you start realizing how fortunate you were that anything worked out and you start to have a perspective of it of how rare it is for lightning to be caught in a bottle and for it all to come together yep. and the more you know about filmmaking the harder it is for that to work and then you look at a christmas story and go well nobody could replicate that like there's just right. no way that just it's a fluke it just it, it's a fluke it, 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 mgm made it it failed. They released it two years in a row. Nobody cared. They still didn't care. Then they went bankrupt. They sold their library to Turner. Turner ended up putting on a 24-hour marathon <laughs> because it had become so successful on VHS because people traded VHSs because they were prized because it cost $100. Right. So it was a big deal. And so yeah. it created a culture of collectivism. And then... Then it went on the on the marathon, and for the first time in in television history, in cinematic history, a film then uh, that went on marathon, its numbers went up. <laughs> More people buy the DVD every year, and numbers keep on going up. Why? It's free. However, the statement that it makes that you're sharing something that connects the family connects children to grandparents everything else is isolated black and white oh it's for old people 
uh, mm. the Santa Claus or a home alone. It's not really for grandparents, it's not really for parents, mm -hmm. just for little kids. And you remember it from when you were a kid, but your kids don't care. But Christmas Story is, pan is, pan is pan generational and it captures an Amer a moment in Americana that is timeless, right? And so to become part of this thing and indebted, embedded with it, so that when people see you, they smile. They're like, hey, I hated you. You scared the hell out of me. Is the most bizarre, magical experience you can have. It's wonderful. And there are times when it's exhausting. I'll tell you, right after Christmas, um, uh, about right after Christmas, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah, <laughs> Give me a couple of months. Right? Like, because it's been a bunch. But 99% of the time, I am grateful. I feel blessed for the experience. The yeah. people I meet are lovely, kind, and trying to share, including me, in some of the greatest moments of their lives. Absolutely, man. And I, I, I think that's a great, great uh, way to look at it. Great approach. And I totally get the, like, there are times kind of like, at, you know, on the 26th of December, you don't want someone to hand you a lamp with a leg in the stocking, <laughs> or whatever. I get that. I mean, there's a time, you know, there's enough of anything. I'm but done. man, yeah. it's kind of like turned out to be. It's a perfect storm. Turned out to be like a perfect movie, you know, of our time. <laughs> it's because it's it's not it's not uh, as candy coated as the the Christmas story uh, that um, the generations before us uh grew up you know uh wonderful life and all that stuff it's got a little more stuff to a little more grit a little more human aspect and i was always uh really happy i was really happy for darren mcgavin i played his son in a pilot when i was a kid and i was a fan of a show he did called That's a night good. stalker yeah. yeah darren mcgavin and a uh, barbara eden i mean barbara uh, felden who was 99 on get smart oh yeah Remember her? yeah Tell me you guys didn't have a crush on crush on her. <laughs> Hello. Right. I loved Dear McGavin. And for uh, a number of years, just didn't see him. And then Christmas Story came out and it became, you know, before he passed, it became a huge, huge deal. And I was all, it always like warmed me, you know. The, uh, what was Darren I, like to work with? Because I honestly had, I had no scenes with him. Uh, I, I saw was rarely ever on the same set as he was. I think I interacted with him briefly but he was also, in my experience, because I wasn't acting with him, he was busy being important on the shit. He had stuff to do. So it could be like, hey, you want to hang out? I'm 13. Yeah. You know, so how yeah, yeah, yeah. your experience with him? Well, be honest with you, Zach. I, I, perhaps I was younger than you were when you did Christmas Story. When I did, I, I believe oh, okay. it was called Father on Trial. It was actually just a NBC or a CBS pilot yeah. where he was a judge and... Barbara Felden was the mom and there were two or three of us kids and it was just a kooky family it, and, it, and it didn't actually, we're still waiting to hear. No, it didn't <laughs> sell. And, um, uh, you know, so I don't really remember too much other than I, I remember the general vibe I would get from, I played a lot of people's kids, you know, there was a couple, I won't mention. It's like, they just didn't like either me it's... or children or hu other humans. Yeah. Right. right. And uh, then there were just like, some were very approachable, warm and, and a joy to work with. And Darren McGavin was that. So I was, I was happy awesome to see her. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, right on. We do. We also want to do ask about uh, Titus that you went with Christopher Titus, Stacy Peach, Cynthia Watchos. How did you get involved in that? I had to, honestly, um, you'll appreciate this Moosey is mm -hmm. so back in the day for those people out there in the world who are not in the in entertainment industry, uh, there's something called the breakdowns and the breakdowns are uh -huh. basically a list of all the roles that are being auditioned for. And it goes to the managers and agents and actors are not allowed to have them unless they do illegal things. And I mm -hmm. did. So I, <laughs> I, I was getting the breakdowns illegally faxed to me. You kids out there won't know what the fax machine is. <laughs> uh, but imagine if you got an email and it came out on your printer. So anyhow, um, <laughs> I was getting all these and I was making a list of everything that I thought I should be up for. And literally I went over to my management, my agency, Gold Marshak, and um, I walked into Sue Wold's office. I walked into every single agent giving them a list and go like, 
here's stuff I should be going for. What the hell's going on? And they looked at me like, get out. Like, who are you? <laughs> right. But yeah, well, you know, I- no brains, all balls. So that's what I did. I walked yeah. into Sue's office and I said, Hey Sue, I've got a, some things, a question. She's like, yeah, okay, go ahead. I said, I gave it to her. She goes, well, this went to a name. This went to a name. This went to a black kid. This went to a fat kid. This went to a Jewish kid. Uh, I don't know why you didn't get a, an audition for this. Hold on. And she picked up the phone and called the casting director. And she said, hi. Yeah, it's Sue Wolf, uh, Gold Marshak. Uh, what about Zach Ward for the role of Dave? Would he pre-read? And she looks at me and I went, that? She goes, yeah, he'll pre-read. Tomorrow at three? Great. And she goes, thanks, Zach. I said, thank you. So I that's how I got the audition. Well, did you walk back into Harry Gold's office and say, what the hell? Here's the thing. My attitude towards... Nobody cares unless you have something to negotiate with. Yeah. So you want to be a homeless guy with a silver hat arguing on the sidewalk? Knock yourself out. Now, that same argument is going to mean a lot more if you're rich or you're carrying some weight. But if you don't have leverage, nobody gives a shit, right? So I didn't have any leverage, except I had had a a couple of TV series in Toronto. I've been working my whole life. But once I moved to LA, nobody gave a crap. They (laughs) might as well be a lie. They never saw those shows. Yeah, I did a Christmas story, but nobody cared about a Christmas story yet. Yeah, correct. So, so I go into the audition. I audition, and I'm doing it sitcommy. And uh, Sheila Guthrie, the casting director, was like, "Yeah, think of it more along the lines of an independent film." I was like, "Oh, thank God!" So I do that. She goes, "Perfect. Come back tomorrow for the uh, producers." So I come back for producers. Uh, Jack Kenny, Brian Hargrove. And I do it. They give me some notes. I come back the following day. I work with Christopher. I do it for Christopher Titus, Jack Kenny, Brian Hargrove. I come mm. back. They give me notes. And now we come back again. We do like a chemistry ses- session with J- J- Christopher Titus and I basically being jackasses, messing <laughs> around with each other. And we do that. And it's working. And it's easy. And it's fun because I have an older brother who's eight years older than me. So I'm used to getting hit in the head when I was a kid. So <laughs> doesn't offend me. That's awesome. With that. And then that is- uh, we go to network. We do the network testing. And it was me. And there was this other guy. And the other guy <sighs> kind of looked like Topher Grace, but with long hair and a ponytail. Mm-hmm. And what I mean is like, he was very thin. And he looks like if you hit him, he'd break. And Right away, you got to remember, Christopher Titus is six foot four, and he's got a giant, giant dinosaur head and Mister Mister Ed teeth, right? So you cannot be in a handy hand to hand scuffle with him without looking like you're going to take some bruises. And he, the other guy, uh, I didn't know, I'd never seen his performance. I'm sure he was fantastic and lovely, but he, you know, him in the same cage as Christopher Titus would look like a mauling. So um, I believe that he was kind of put up as a straw dog. So, and the studio selected me. Um, wow. And, you know, the reality is I bumped into a lot of really talented actors who had told me that, that they had been up for the role of Dave. And, you know, Moosey, you get this. The right role, the right time in your life, and a whole bunch of luck, and maybe it works. Yeah. And maybe, and still, right? And yeah. still, maybe the series the, gets canceled, right? So, right. Like, what do you do? And maybe the the parents that uh, they cast all that you did everything you can, but the parents have red hair or they don't. You know what I mean? The, the, those little <laughs> things get in your way. I got a question for you, Zach. Were you the dude who said you could taste the colors with your mind, brother? In Almost Famous, oh, holy crap! <laughs> I wrote that line. I wrote that line. <laughs> did you? Yes, I did. I only kind of liked you before now. <laughs> so let me tell you, uh, by the way, that's the only credit we both worked on. I worked on almost famous as oh, well. Did you? Yeah, I did a uh, voiceover work, ladies and gentlemen, still water or whatever. I did some VO stuff in that, nice. uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. I made the movie. I made the film. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I also, I've known, I knew I've known Cameron Crow since long before he even wrote anything that made it to the, whatever. He was an actor in a film nice. we did together, American Hot Wax. Anyway, uh, your movie, Almost Famous, man, 
I have like four or five posters in in uh, the other room, and Almost Famous is one of them. I I just love the movie, and that's what made me. I'm a big Billy Crudup fan. I think the guy's just a. It, I, I, he's even on the morning show, our stage beauty was amazing. But when he's on the morning show, which is like a safer, less gritty kind of deal, I'm watching him, you know, not anyone is doing the dialogue. I love that movie. How cool is that to be a part of a, a, a movie like that? It was awesome. That was really cool. And that, that line we had, we had done that. The scene was so big. Cause it's like a big ass one or well, it's like four cameras are set up hidden in that, in that back area of the stadium. Uh-huh. And, and we were practicing it and I, I've got this tattoo of a magic mushroom on my arm and th the whole thing apparently with almost famous and, and the, uh, the Allman brothers band is that the, it's the mushroom. It's actually a penis in a vagina. Apparently yeah. that's <laughs> super cool and groovy, whatever. So <laughs> we had this weird moment where I walk up to there, everybody on still water, they're like, Hey, red dog, red dog. And I'm like, Hey man, how's it going brother? brother? We all got these now. And on mass, all the actors go, <laughs> and it's the most dead moment. It just <laughs> stuck the life. We're like, "Hey, everybody, look at this." <laughs> that is. Anyways, so right? Awesome. So I was like, "This sucks." And then uh, I turned to Cameron, and I was like, "Hey, man, I got an idea. Can I just can I just riff on uh, on this on this?" He's like, mm -hmm. "What?" Is that I just want to riff on this? He goes. What, what are you talking about? I was like, I just want to improvise something. He's like, we have four cameras. I'm like, no, no, just during rehearsal. He's like, uh, uh, okay. Cause it's not a big role. And so he doesn't know me very well. Yeah. So um, I go in, I'm like, hey, we got, we got the, we got all these now. And I, and they looked, I said to look down and go, you can taste the colors with your mom, brother. <laughs> and one of them, they're like, ha ha, yeah. And now the scene starts to pop. Like they're having something to interact with as opposed to nice tattoo, dude. So that we finished yeah. it off and then camera's like, Oh, that was great. That was awesome. And so he would have me improvise in scenes and mess with other people who didn't oh. know that Cameron asked me to just screw with the scene. So they're looking <laughs> at me like, Hey, shut up. It's my yeah. line now. Right? Yeah. Now they don't know what scene they're in, but yeah, they're yeah. like, why is this idiot talking? And I'm like, uh, he told me to. So yeah, uh, that's awesome, man. And you know what? Uh, I I don't know this, but I I don't know if I would have remembered. Hey, nice tattoo. So you really you really gave <laughs> to that man. That was just the greatest line. I remember it stuck with me. Uh, that means a lot. Uh, Thanks, dude. Right Thanks, on, dude. absolutely, yeah. man. That that was a fun one to write. You know, it's like get somebody to like get groovy with it, get all high off the mushrooms, man. You know, that was yeah. fun. Uh, was so? Did you you had this like? Was that all you? The growth, the hair? No, oh, no, okay. that was all fake. Fake hair, fake mustache, oh, fake beard. Good job. It was gorgeous. It was like $15,000 worth of stuff. And wow. Uh, wow. it was so awesome, dude. Cause like you're walking around with this beautiful red hair, this beard, and you got the, you're doing that Macon County Georgian accent, man, taking your time when you're talking. You got super tight pants on. Everybody's looking at your bulge. <laughs> and you're walking around like, dude, I felt like Austin <laughs> Powers, like, all right, ladies, how's it going? Good to meet you. It right. was hilarious. It <laughs> was so awesome. much fun. Yeah. So now Jonathan's going to uh, take us from your penis vagina tattoo story <laughs> to promoting your family film. Well, yes, first I got to ask, I gotta so ask one other thing first. I, I do. You, you were talking about fanning. I'm a big horror fan and you, you've you been a lot. And so I yeah. do have to ask first about Freddy versus Jason. So I'm going okay. to some of your experiences there because that was such a fun film for me to watch as a fan. Uh, so back to penises. Uh, <laughs> in, in Freddy versus Jason... <laughs> I am uh, in a bathtub filled with blood and I have to come out of the bathtub. Um, and then there's something in the business that just for the fans at home, when you're naked in a scene and they don't look directly at your junk, they cover <laughs> it with something what we call uh, a cock sock. Sorry, but it's basically <laughs> the, it's like, it's like imagine like a triangle of mm -hmm. underpants that you put and they tape on your stomach there. But 
here's the thing about nudity on a film set is everybody's trying to be professional, but everybody's uncomfortable. Yep. And that really gets in the way of the process. And here's the thing is, I'm not a pretty girl. Nobody is lusting after me. I've seen me naked. I'm not impressed. So <laughs> my goal was to try and make everybody just comfortable. And I've been nude on other films before. And the whole vibe was very like, we're not looking. And let's do our job. And hello, friend, who is a person, I guess. Like, it was all very awkward. So I did this thing where um, I now walk onto the set and people are turning around to look at me as, you know, I take my bathrobe off. There I am nude. And now people are laughing. And here's why. Because on that little triangle of cloth that is taped to my stomach and holding in my genitalia, I have drawn a happy face and little eyes. So that when people look down, it looks like it's giving them a wink. And now we're all on the same joke. We can all laugh right. my junk yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. And now we all go, okay, we got it out of the way. Let's just go do some horror. Great. Um, that was fun. Uh, I was hot pink for about, I mean, I'm red anyways, like my hair and my skin. But getting out of that tub full of blood, I was, I was hot pink for about two weeks. Um, my mom was there. She was in Vancouver. So she went, she was on set with me, which is awesome. Um, lots of prosthetics all over the arms. Robert England was teaching me how to speak like him and how to walk, uh, like him as if the Freddy oh, glove. So cool. <laughs> yeah. So he said, the key is to pretend that the glove weighs 50 pounds. So instead of having it on your hand like this, it pulls you down. So one shoulder goes up, the other one goes down. And it's like you're doing a uh, all that jazz type of uh, choreography. So it was great. I got to work with a legend, you know, from my sure. childhood. Amazing. Well, like you said, you know, we have so, you've been so many things. And you know, we can honestly keep you here all day. But let's go back to Keepers of the Five Kingdoms. So, how, so you mentioned how can people find it now. Uh, so it's on all the streaming platforms. And it's available everywhere. And what are some of the things that you want, I guess your experience is just making it that people can know of as they're watching it. I think they can have popcorn. They can watch it with their parents. They can be parents. They can watch it with their kids. Everybody's going to have that opportunity where they will enjoy the film. Uh, I have a lot of friends who have kids and they suffer through watching kids content. And when I say kids, a seven-year-old can watch this. A 15-year-old can watch this. A 20-year-old can watch this. A 30-year-old will love this. So I wanted to make something that, you know, it's not for all people, obviously. If you didn't like The Goonies, you ain't gonna like this movie. If you don't yeah. like uh, Dark Crystal, ain't for you, buddy. Um, if you I just want to see sci-fi, is that your movie? But if you like Indiana Jones, if you like The Mummy, if you like never ending story, this is your world. This is this is good. You're gonna enjoy this. You're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck. How can people follow you on social media? Um, my social media is Total Zach Ward, T O T A L Z A C K W A R D. On on Twitter, I do not have the blue check mark because I'm not paying fifteen dollars for something <laughs> that I had before. And I earned, <laughs> and now any jack knob can call themselves whatever they like. At I least you're not have, bitter about it. <laughs> no, I'm not bitter. It's just stupid. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And I'm not calling it X. It's Twitter. Whatever. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, it's Twitter. Uh, uh, and then on Instagram, it's the exact same thing. Total Zach Warden. That is verified. And uh, yeah, hit me up. Say howdy. Let me know what you think. Right on, man. Hey, Zach. Damn it. Go, go to what, what, what you're working on next. What am I working on next? Um, well, I've got I've got a TV show for HBO coming out, um, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say which one yet. Uh, <laughs> so I can't really release that, but I'm very excited about it. Oh. Um, yeah. And then uh, what else is next? I, I got a, I got some other projects I'm working on for writing at the moment, but that's kind of been my focus. This mm -hmm. has been this has been my labor of love for a while. Sure. So uh, going back to the gym, 
and uh, um, yeah, loving on my right. wife. That's basically been it. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Zach. Man, you you know, uh, I like the cut of your jib. You are a cool <laughs> dude. And um, next time I see you in person, I'm not just gonna go, "Hey, good to see you." Congratulations. <laughs> you know, because like, we didn't know each other. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll be the guy just giving you a hug, and you're gonna go security. Yeah. Say, hey, it's Moosey. I'll be like, ah! hey, yeah. <laughs> right on. Well, congratulations so, on yes. everything, man. Uh, 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 keepers and and uh, hopefully you'll. I don't know. You're gonna do it's any cool kind of follow up to that film? I don't know. You gotta wait to see how it does. You know, that's yeah. that's the job. Um, right. Right. It's been a long ride. It's been a lot of work. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. That's not what you want to hear, man. It was exhausting, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joy, but like, <laughs> let, give the guy a chance to rest. I'm going to nap. Right. I'm going to take a nap. You know, yeah. a little sleeper room. <laughs> right. Well, Zach, you're welcome back. We'd love to have you anytime you'd like. And it's such a treat to get to speak to you today. Oh, thanks, man. <clears throat> this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Well, again, this has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen with Moosey Dreyer. And again, a very special thanks to Zach Ward. And please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for tuning in to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. Listening to this podcast just makes you really cool.